our risen Christ, I welcome you to this virtual worship service and invite you to take a moment to breathe deep, to be present to the place wherever you are so that you can be with us in spirit as well as in body. Let's take a moment of silence to prepare our hearts to worship God. This journey that we've been on has not always been easy. There have been blind turns and steep hills to negotiate, an odd pothole or two along the way. But there have also been spirit moments of joyful reminders of the beauty around us and heartfelt glimpses of what may still come. But whatever the journey holds, we gather to affirm we don't make it alone. Shall we join together for the call to worship? Christ has risen. Christ, Christ is, is risen, risen indeed. indeed. Christ is with us on the journey. Christ, Christ is, is with us, us at, at the, the table. table. Christ is with us when we rest. Christ, Christ is, is with, with us, us when, when we wake. wake. Christ is with us when we grieve. Christ, Christ is with us when we rejoice. Christ is risen. Christ, Christ is risen indeed. Come and find the quiet center in the crowded life we live. Find the room for hope to enter. Find the frame where we are free. confess our lives, we are calling on God who promises not only to hear, but to heal us with forgiveness and hope. Shall we pray? First in silence, then together. We offer our hands, thanks, Holy, Holy One, with, with open, open hearts, hearts, minds, and, and spirits. We gather that you're grateful that your, that your arms are thrown so wide and, and welcome. It is, it is in the security of that embrace that we, that we confess we do not deserve such warmth or acceptance. acceptance. We, we have let, let you down in so many ways. We have, have failed to reflect your goodness in, in the, the words, words we have spoken, spoken in, the in the way we, we have treated others, and in, and in the selfish things we have done. We, we ask for your forgiveness, but more than that, 
we, we ask, ask for the courage to choose to do better. To do better. Help, Help us to remember every minute of every, of every day that, that we are yours, loved by, by you, called by you. Let, let that, that love and that, that calling make us generous, generous towards, towards others and, and more loving towards you. you. Be Lord, Lord of our lives, lives this day, day and forever. forever. Amen. Amen. In the times we think we're most alone, Christ is with us. When we are most distraught, Christ is beside us. When we are grieving, Christ is silently listening. When we rejoice, Christ is celebrating with us. Know that you are never truly alone. Know that you are always loved. Know that you are God's beloved. Thanks be to God. We are forgiven and given a new life. Amen. As we prepare to hear the scripture lesson, let us open our hearts and minds for what God might speak to our lives this morning. In these moments of isolation, wondering what tomorrow might bring, we turn to you, O oh God, and ask that you speak a word of hope to our hearts and souls. In these uncertain days, we pray for eyes to see and hearts to know where you are at work in life, in death, in every moment. This we pray in Jesus' name, amen. So the scripture lesson for this morning comes from the Gospel of Luke, reading from chapter 24, beginning with verse one. It is Easter day. Actually, it's in the evening when the story begins. The women have come and told the disciples that uh, the tomb is empty and that they have seen the Lord, the risen Lord, but they haven't experienced that yet. And so the story begins here. Listen now for what the Spirit speaks to your life today. Now on that same day, two of them were going to a village called Emmaus, about seven miles from Jerusalem, and talking with each other about these things that had happened. And while they were talking and discussing, Jesus himself came near and went with them but their eyes were kept from recognizing him. And he said to them, What are you discussing with each other while you walk along? And they stood still, looking sad. And then one of them, whose name was Cleophas, answered him, Are you the only stranger in Jerusalem who does not know the things that have taken place there in these days? He asked him. What things? The things about Jesus of Nazareth, who was a prophet, mighty in deed and word before God and all the people, and how our chief priests and leaders handed him over to be condemned to death and crucified him. But we had hoped that he was the one to redeem Israel. Yes, and besides all this, it is now the third day since these things took place. Moreover, some women of our group astounded us. They were at the tomb early this morning, and when they did not find his body there, they came back and told us that they had indeed seen a vision of angels who said that he was alive. Some of those who were there with us went to the tomb and found it just as the women said, but they did not see him. Oh, how foolish you are and how slow of heart to believe all that the prophets have declared. Was it not necessary that the Messiah should suffer these things and then enter into his glory? And beginning with Moses and all the prophets, he interpreted to them the things about himself in the scriptures. And as they came near the village to which they were going, he walked ahead as if he were going on. But they urged him strongly, saying, Stay with us, because it is almost evening and the day is now nearly over. 
So he went in to stay with them. And when he was at the table with them, he took bread, blessed and broke it, and gave it to them. And then their eyes were opened, and they recognized him, and he vanished from their sight. And they said to one another, Were not our hearts burning within us while he was talking to us on the road, while he was opening the scriptures to us? And that same hour, they got up, returned to Jerusalem, and they found the eleven and their companions gathered together. And they were saying, The Lord is risen indeed, and he has appeared to Simon. And then they told what had happened to them on the road and how he had been made known to them in the breaking of the bread. This ends the reading for today. May God bless it to our understanding and build up our faith through it. To God be all praise and glory, now and forever. Amen. So the hallway and the waiting room outside the hospital intensive care unit was jammed with 18 and 19 year olds. It was after midnight. Tears were flowing. Faces had the look of surprise and dismay all over them. I'd been there most of the day having received a phone call from one of my members that their son had been in an automobile accident and could I meet them at the hospital. There had been an emergency surgery that morning to try to repair an aorta that had been torn, and now his parents were speaking with the doctors. And that's when his mom turned to me and whispered, he's gone. Mark uh, wasn't the most popular kid in town. Uh, he'd struggled through school. He'd struggled to make and keep friends. He'd struggled... Uh, to do his schoolwork, he'd struggled just finding his way in life. He'd struggled with alcohol, and it seemed that he was finally beginning to get a foothold the year after he graduated. And his father had told me later that Mark was one of those kids who was always trying to push a rope uphill. And now he'd met his end. And all these kids from town who knew him and the family had gathered in the hallway. At Mark's funeral, I began with words that summed up what I'd seen and felt in those days between his death and the service. These have been brokenhearted days. Then there was another room, a family room, equipped with a hospital bed. Jane and her two daughters had been there as her husband and father lay dying from an aggressive cancer. I'd been called mid-morning because the end seemed near, and Dr. Wines, you know, had lived a good life. He'd been our ophthalmologist. Uh, he'd taken good care of my family's eyes. Uh, he had loved his wife. It was a, a obviously romantic, deep connection that they had with one another, and his girls adored their father. Been a great storyteller, fantastic sense of humor. But when I entered the house that morning, his wife said to me, I think we're losing the battle today. And then the daughters and mom climbed into the bed next to him, and the girls sang what he had always sung to him, that he had always sung to them, you are my sunshine, my only sunshine. And within an hour, he was gone. Brokenhearted days. That's what the two disciples had experienced over the past few days in Jerusalem. They were on their way out of town and making their way to Emmaus just hours after the women had found the empty tomb. So much had happened, none of which they really understood. They couldn't wrap their hearts or minds around. And the story tells us that they were walking along, talking to each other about all these things that had happened. It's what the teenagers were doing in the emergency room, talking about all the things that had happened, trying to make sense of a death that shouldn't have occurred. Cleopas and the other disciples kept walking and talking when the risen Christ joined them on the road. The story says that their eyes were kept from perceiving him. 
They had no idea who he was, but they went on to tell this supposed stranger all the things that had happened to them. In the lightning speed recitation of the events, they say something that captures the depth of their dismay. But we had hoped. They had hoped that he would have been the one to redeem Israel, and instead he had met a violent and cruel end. But we had hoped, they said. But we had hoped. It was like what Mrs. Wine said that day so long ago, I think we're losing this battle today. The disciples on the road to Emmaus, talking about all these things that had happened, trying to make sense out of a death that didn't make any sense at all to them. And they had hoped for something else. They were brokenhearted. And I guess, I would bet, that you have walked your own Emmaus roads. I know that I have. Barbara Brown Taylor says, it is the road you walk when your team has lost. Your candidate has been defeated. Your loved one has died. The long road back to the empty house. The piles of unopened mail. To life as usual. If life can ever be usual again. Frederick Buechner describes Emmaus in different words. Emmaus, the place where you go in order to escape, he says, a bar, a movie, wherever it is that we throw up our hands and say, let the whole damn thing hang, makes no difference anyway. Emmaus is where we go when these, where these two went to try to forget about Jesus and the great failure of his life. We're all walking down our varieties of Emmaus roads because we all have our own varieties of disappointments, our own experiences of doubt. We've also hoped that Jesus would be the one to make everything right in the world. We were reminded on Easter Sunday that as much as our world might feel like a Good Friday world, We need to remember that this is an Easter world, that Christ is risen, that we have been given a new perspective on life, a world where Christ is alive and not has risen, but is risen, a world where love still comes up beside you and walks along with you. Yet we're so pummeled with messages that say just the opposite. The disciples couldn't res- recognize the risen Christ, even though he sidled right up next to them. Their eyes, the story says, were kept from recognizing him. And what, what is it then that keeps our eyes from recognizing the risen Christ right here and right now in our lives today? The disciples seem to know the story. They told Jesus about the events of the past few days, but they couldn't understand. They couldn't wrap their heads around it, or maybe they didn't want to understand that the one who came to redeem Israel would inevitably suffer and die. Not because God required the suffering, but because suffering in this life is just a part of what goes with the territory. Jesus had told them this over and over again when he was still among them, and they couldn't get it then, and they still couldn't wrap their heads around it. So is it our expectations that keep us from recognizing the risen Christ when he comes up alongside us? Our expectations that we should be protected from suffering. Our expectation that our country should be protected from suffering and failure and decline. Our expectation that college degrees and all of our studies should keep us from losing our jobs. Our expectation that we can beat aging. Our expectation that if we see the doctor regularly and eat right, we won't get sick. Our expectation that relationships last forever. Do our dashed hopes keep us from recognizing the risen Christ when he pops up right in front of us? Because we had hoped.
We had hoped the two on their way to Emmaus had said. Whereas part of what keeps us experiencing the risen Christ is that we know the story, but to us it's just a story. Is it that we know it in our heads, but not in our hearts? Who on the way to Emmaus knew all the details of the story, but while they were telling all of these things to Jesus, they were so focused on what they knew or what they thought they knew that they missed the fact that the risen Christ was right there with them. He was just anybody to them. Barbara Brown Taylor again says, the blindness of the two disciples does not keep their Christ from coming to them. He does not limit his post-resurrection appearances to those with full confidence in him. He comes to the disappointed, the doubtful, the disconsolate. He comes to those who do not know their Bible who do not recognize him even when they are walking right with him beside them. He comes to those who have given up and are heading back home. You know, the other thing I think that keeps us from recognizing Christ in our day-to-day life is that we rely on the extraordinary. We fail to see the risen Christ because we resist seeing God in the most ordinary of experiences. And the disciples finally recognize him as he breaks bread, shares a meal with them, just an ordinary meal. Jesus stayed with the disciples and simply shared bread. Pretty ordinary thing. So, in these days, one of the things that has come to me is how all the other extraneous things have been stripped away. The things that I thought were so important to my life. My golf score. My ability to just go shopping whenever I wanted, whether to the grocery store, to eat whatever you know I wanted. And if it wasn't in the house, I'd just run down to the store and get it. My Ability to just connect with people, to see them whenever I wanted, to give them a hug, to talk with them. Those ordinary experiences that enrich my life, that I had taken for granted. Now I recognize the beauty in them, the grace in them, the way that God meets me in those things that I'd forgotten. To see my grandkids on FaceTime and to hear them tell stories of their day, how they're learning to ride their bikes and balance without training wheels. To sit and enjoy a meal with Julie and just talk about the day, about those little moments, the birds that we heard singing or the good walk that we took, or the person that we'd had a chance to call on the telephone and connect with. The risen Christ is with us, even in those ordinary moments. But we have to have hearts to experience that. To not just look at the head and say, well, this is what's going on. We're shut in and we can't be connected to each other. But in our hearts, we know that we can. We know that those conversations are meaningful and important. So we're all on that Emmaus road, I think, trying to figure it all, it, it all out. But whether we can see or not, the risen Christ is walking with us alongside us, because God loves us, loves us more than we can imagine, and because God so wants us to know that that love has come to us and allows us to be more loving, to be more gracious, to notice the beauty of life and the world around us. 
even if we've been broken hearted these days. I'd encourage you to ask Jesus to stay with you a while and to experience him in the ordinary. Amen. So I'd invite you to join your hearts with me in a time of prayer. And as we do, I want you to, um, I, I just need to update you on a couple of things. We had heard that Iker uh, was home from the hospital and doing okay, and we've since received word that they found uh, an abnormality uh, that requires surgery. And so we want to continue to pray for Iker. I've also heard from uh, Todd that his friend, Scott, is uh, on the mend and that we're grateful for that. And then uh, uh, I, I think those are the ones that I have that are updates, but I invite you to, uh, if you have that list, to continue to be praying uh, for those folks that are on there that I'll mention in our prayers today. But will you join your hearts with me as we pray? Risen Christ, when things happen that we find hard to deal with and our head goes down and our eyes see no farther than our feet, we pray that you would help us to be honest with you, even if it's through tears or anger, that you would help us to see you walking alongside us, help us to trust that you're there even when we cannot see or feel you close. And then gently tilt our faces to look into yours, to find there a limitless compassion, endless understanding and patience, and the courage that we need to begin again. Today, we bring to you those who are in our hearts today, uh, the Jeff Coats and the pain of losing their child, Ethan. We continue to pray for Phyllis Andrew. Anderson's uh, nephew, Adam, who had to go to the emergency room. We continue to pray for Andrea's Blum's friend, Victor, who's going through chemotherapy now. We think of Sally Crawford's niece, uh, Kate, who has uh, multiple medical challenges and is separated from family across the country. Pray for Iker and his family as he faces surgery and perhaps uh, healing from this problem that has been keeping him from being healthy. Hear us as we pause in a moment of silence to pray for those that were not mentioned but are on our hearts today that need your grace. Thank you, O oh God, that uh, you have brought ordinary miracles to our lives, that Todd's friend Scott is getting better, and that uh, Deb Elliott is uh, recovering in a good place and is grateful for the prayers that we've offered. There are so many beautiful things that have come out of this moment if we can pause and see your presence in them. And so we thank you for the beautiful days that we've enjoyed. We thank you uh, for keeping most of us healthy. We pray uh, and thank you in thanksgiving for all those who have stood on the front lines providing uh, food on all the different levels that it takes to get it to us and those who are in hospitals and care facilities. And Lord, I, uh, as I pray, I remember uh, Stephen's mother who's in a nursing home back outside of Chicago and pray in particular for those who are in those spaces that seem so at risk because of their age and other issues and their proximity to each other. So gracious God, hear us as we continue to offer our prayers of thanksgiving to you. Receive our heartfelt love and appreciation for the ways that you've touched our lives and continue to give us strength and courage to rekindle the flame of hope as we go about our days. 
and even now as we join our voices to pray Jesus' prayer together, saying, Our Father, Father Mother, Mother, who art in heaven, heaven, hallowed, hallowed be, be thy, thy name. name. Thy, thy kingdom, kingdom come, come, thy will, thy will be, be done, done, on earth as it is in heaven. heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and, bread, and, and forgive, forgive us our, our sins, as we, as we forgive those who sin against us. us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the, power, and the glory, glory forever. forever. Amen. Amen. because life is short and we have so little time to gladden the hearts of those who walk this journey with us. Be generous with your love. Be kinder than is necessary. Never repay anyone evil for evil, but always seek reconciliation, forgiveness, and grace. Find hope even in the midst of despair. Look for the risen Christ even on those brokenhearted days. Because the God of grace who created you, the God of love who has redeemed and saved you, and the spirit of life that lives within you is with you now and will be forever. Amen. Amen.